I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sherrod Kutum. You're watching Consider This, the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. Recently, a panel of the world's top biodiversity scientists convened to investigate links between pandemic risk and environmental degradation. Their just released report asserts that we need to address uh, the underlying causes of pandemics, which they say are also the causes of biodiversity loss and climate change. Now, before we get to that discussion, let's first review the impact of the pandemic and our response to it on uh, the environmental sectors here in Malaysia. Joining us on the show tonight to discuss this further, we have Wong Siu Lin. She's the co-founder of Makaranga, which is a portal covering the environment and sustainability in Malaysia. Siu Lin, welcome. Um, your portal, Makaranga, has been looking at the question of uh, environmental impact. Uh, can you help paint a broad picture for us uh, of what you've observed to be the impact of this pandemic on the environment? Yes, certainly. Um, basically, we looked at five uh, different sectors. We looked at climate change, we looked at zoos and aquaria, we looked at indigenous people, uh, specifically on Atli, ecotourism and conservation. And basically, um, every single sector uh, in environment had been impacted by uh, COVID-19. Uh, a large part of it actually is related to uh, the economy. So when the economy took a beating and it continues to take a beating, the environmental sectors are also affected. Uh, Silin, uh, it's been a couple of months now since, uh, you know, we, we trace it back, not so much to the, the outbreak of the pandemic, but really the lockdown, the MCO that's had the impact on the economy, not just here in Malaysia, but because, because of the wider economic situation. Uh, what have you noticed about uh, our responses with, uh, from the various stakeholders, whether it's government or uh, communities, uh, uh, researchers, uh, conservationists? Uh, what are you looking at in your in your uh, uh, kind of survey of this uh, of the landscape? Yeah, uh, really, I, I think you know the, the main thing is to look at uh, whether each of the different uh, the actors in the different sectors were actually able to first of all cope with the with the pandemic and the, the lockdown, as you mentioned, it's the MCO a lot of the times that uh, you know causes the greatest grief, uh, uh, as well as. Uh, are they able to continue doing the activities that we want to do? So, for example, we looked at uh, ecotourism, uh, and one of the concerns really was uh, ecotourism, for example, in Sabah, which they, they is actually called the golden goose of ecotourism in Malaysia, because virtually every single um, attraction in Sabah has got something to do with nature, wildlife, and so on and so forth. So uh, one of the concerns there in terms of ecotourism would be uh, the people who are involved in ecotourism, specifically local communities who actually uh, have been earning an income from ecotourism, how badly were they impacted by uh, COVID and by the lockdown? And have they, as a result of suffering from both of these, uh, sort of gone back and started um, utilizing the natural resources for survival? Uh, that had otherwise become uh, imperative to protect or to conserve to earn an income. Mm. Uh, I think that's very important. Uh, we will be touching on ecotourism and conservation a little bit uh, later in, in the show. Uh, but before that, I do want to ask you, I mean, this past few months uh, has seen a significant slowdown in human activity. Surely that must have been good for the environment. You know, there's, there's less humans trampling about. Well, yes, we, we actually talked about this last time I was here. Uh, you know, it was like turtles were coming up to land on PD, Port Dixon Beach. Uh, you know, the, the river Klang was actually really clean. Uh, but, I, but I'm sure that everybody is aware of the stories that have come through of uh, since uh, the MCO was lifted uh, gradually over the last few months, that, for example, uh, masks were being found drifting along the river Klang. Uh, found on, on beaches. So humans, as, as soon as the MPO lifted, and because we are unable to travel and pollute other countries, um, have decided to go to our nature and uh, uh, sort of leave quite a large impact in, in, in all those different areas. Sulin, could you tell us a little bit about this island community, the Mantanani uh, community that you uh, looked at in your work? 
Yes, certainly. Uh, Montelani is an island uh, in Sabah uh, of uh, Kuda, uh, which is in the northwest coast of uh, Sabah. And it became uh, it was, it was an island of fishes, traditional fishes, fishes about 1,000 uh, members strong. And they were actually uh, using unsustainable practices such as fish bombing. And it actually became well known as a center for fish bombing, unfortunately. And because of the fish bombing, they were actually catching fewer and fewer fish, and as a result, were falling into quite deep poverty. So uh, operators from the mainland started uh, recognizing how beautiful the island is and going out there and bringing tourists out there. And in the state of about eight to nine years, uh, the number of tourists grew from 500 to, to you know, like uh, thousands of uh, tourists. In fact, then it became a little bit unsustainable. But what it did was it provided uh, locals with an opportunity to uh, earn an income through tourism. So, um, and, and as a result, fish bombing actually uh, dropped. Uh, and, uh, you know, locals started learning other skills in tourism with the help of uh, NGOs, uh, specifically Reef Check Malaysia. They have a very strong presence there and sort of taught them skills and got them to start conserving uh, the, the, the natural resources because it then became a, a means for them to start uh, earning money in right. place of, uh, you know, uh, fishing, having to go out further and further to try and get fish. So do you reckon these changes could be made permanent uh, even after uh, lockdowns are lifted and, you know, we've adapted to the pandemic? For sure, yeah. I think uh, once, they, once fisher folk sort of get an, a sense of uh, an ability, basically an alternative livelihood to fishing, uh, you know, they learn new skills such as language, you know, so languages in fact, so they, they were learning Mandarin, you know, um, as well as English, uh, and then interacting with tourists and, and learn, learning new skills like handicraft, it actually is, uh, it did become a very viable uh, means of income for them. And then COVID hit, and then the NCO hit, and then tourists stopped coming, you know, so the villagers actually needed uh, food aid from the mainland. So again, the NGO came in and helped that, uh, as, as well as, uh, you know, local authorities. Uh, and, and what's happened then is that uh, the NGO decided, you know, together with the community, that maybe it's time to not focus 100% on, on tourism as a means of income, but look at yet other alternative uh, means of income, which are not dependent on tourist arrivals. So they have just started this, they got a, a grant, uh, from Yasan Hassana, and they have just started uh, looking at uh, producing virgin coconut oil because there's lots of uh, coconuts uh, on the island. They're looking at abalone farming, and they're also looking at community, community gardening, right. which is actually very important for a lot of the rural communities and indigenous communities throughout Malaysia oh, uh, for food, um, what do you call it, for food security. That's brilliant. Okay, well, let's come back. We're going to take a quick break, but let's come back to uh, that conversation about ecotourism and conservation. After this, we'll invite a conversation, a conversationalist, a conservationist, <laughs> if I got that right, to the conversation. Stay tuned to consider this. <laughs> Welcome back to Consider This with Sherrod and I. Let's continue our look at the impact the pandemic has had on the environment with uh, Wong Su Lin. She's from Makaranga. And also we'd like to welcome to the conversation Wong Su T. He's the founder and CEO of Bornean Sun Bear Conservation Centre in Sepilot Sabah. Su T, uh, if I may begin with you. Now, uh, tell us a little bit about the impact the last eight months or so of the pandemic has had on your uh, conservation work. How has it impacted? Okay, so uh, since 2014, when our centre is open to the public, we use the business model of having tourists to come to our centre and they pay the ticketing to see the bears, to learn about the environment, and then we generate revenues from these tourists. And then, uh, but after uh, March 18, when our MCO started, our center was asked to close uh, until now. So the revenues generation, uh, generating mechanisms has been completely failed to uh, tourism. So right now we are having this dilemma of uh, not, cannot generate any revenues, but at the same time, our operations cost is still resumed. So that is the biggest impact on our work, yeah. Mm. 
Uh, CUT, if you could explain to us why you chose this particular model, considering you are a research center, you know, I mean, you're not an entertainment center, as it were. Couldn't there have been funds coming from universities or grant giving organizations uh, to fund your research? Yes, yeah, I know that is an option, but you know, since I first started doing Sunday research work back in 1998, I have been struggling on trying to get funding through writing grants and uh, donations, you know, and then uh, and, and it's, it's, it's not easy, you know, try to get funding, try to get grants is not easy because we are literally compete uh, with other potential competitors or researchers across the world. And looking at sun bears is the least known bear in the world. And uh, life is really hard to, 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 to compete. And funders, funding agency always says, ah, oh, there's a lot of people uh, apply, but there's not enough funds. So I need to come up with a very good business model to sustain and run the center, which is looking at the tourist, uh, tourism money. Does and that... then our location... I'm sorry, CT, yeah. just, just uh, wanted to ask you, does that make a difference that, you know, sun bears are not widely known? I mean, it, does the type of conservation work and the species that you're looking at matter in terms of funding? Oh, yes, very, very. Yeah, sun bears used to be listed as data decision under the IOCN Red, Red Book listing. So we are literally compete with species that is more endangered. And then back in 2006, sun bears finally upgraded to become a uh, vulnerable species. But the endangerment is still not yet, not, uh, not sexy enough, you know, not severe enough to compete with other critically endangered species like orangutans, ele ele uh, uh, tigers, rhino, and so on. So there is this kind of competitions uh, happen in this conservation world of a lot of people require lots of money, but there's not enough money to, to, to give everything else. So I need to come up with a good business plan to run the operation. Right, so Linda, if I could draw you into this conversation, I mean, you know, sun bears are extraordinarily cute. <laughs> uh, and I think on the cute scale, they probably are very, uh, uh, you know, they're uh, attractive. Mm. But uh, God forbid you're trying to save an animal that's ugly. Uh, so Lynn, <laughs> is, you know, Suti's situation uh, emblematic of similar types of research centers around the, the country trying to do conservation work? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, conservation in the first place is, is, is not a very easy field to sort of get involved in because the money is very, very hard to get into in, in a country like Malaysia. Uh, and we ran, we at Makaranga ran a survey in May this year to try and capture the impact of COVID on conservation groups as well. 17 respondents, small and large, uh, doing all sorts of conservation work from funding to research. Um, and uh, what we found was just right across the board, everybody was having a hard time. When we checked in again with them uh, in October, it was both COVID as well as the NCO that actually left quite a big impact on them. And we found that actually things hadn't changed very much in those few months. Uh, so uh, what happened was before the NCO, about 60% of conservation groups had enough funding to see them through the rest of the year. And uh, by uh, you know, October, uh, that had slipped, and about 55% said that they either had no funding, not enough funding for the rest of the year, or were not sure that they would have enough funding. And the other thing that was notable is the level of anxiety being felt by uh, conservation groups. Well, these, these people are pretty tough. People like CT are pretty tough. Uh, but, you know, the level of anxiety was like 76%, you know, of respondents registering a very high level of uh, worry about both funding as well as activities. And we asked them out of, you know, um, out of a, a, on a scale of 10, 1 to 10, uh, a lot of them were registering 8, 9, 10, particularly when we asked about uh, the years ahead, uh, next year and beyond. Okay, so okay, I'm going to ask you, T, about uh, the level of anxiety. You talked a little bit earlier about you know uh, having trouble to just keep operational cost uh, afloat. What does that mean, T, T, if uh, funding has dried up, to ecotourism dollars have dried up? Are you under pressure um, to keep your conservation center open? Is are you in danger of closing? Oh yes, oh yes, definitely, because uh, our operational cost is quite high, relatively speaking. So every month, uh, our, uh, our average operation cost is 120000 a month. 
So I need to come up with at least 120,000 ringgit to pay salary, to pay for the bare food, the medicines, the maintenance of the facilities and things like that. So without this constant incomes from the tourism sector, then, you know, I may running out of uh, funds. Uh, so, so like, say, for example, right now we have had this uh, pandemic and closed down for so many months now. We have we have a net loss of, of close to 800,000 ringgit. And luckily, we did have some saving, but our saving is limited. We are, you know, running out of our saving uh, pretty soon. And therefore, we need desperate help from the government, uh, from funders uh, to make it, to help us pass this very, very difficult time. Sulin, so what do you think would happen if uh, centers close down? It, it, would it be just a pause or would we actually lose all the good work that's been done and unlikely to see these uh, initiatives resurrected uh, when, as it were, good times return? It would be quite devastating because, uh, you know, in terms of research, uh, you, you kind of need to collect, like SUTI, for example, I know has been collecting data for many years, you know, and that's absolutely invaluable. As it is, even some researchers are saying they're, they're sort of panicking because uh, they've not been able to co collect data from March up to whenever it is, you know, even some of them up, up to now. Uh, with the MCO coming, you can't just ramp up stuff and then just shut it down like that, you know. Uh, and it will be devastating because uh, a lot of people also, young conservation, is, I think I heard uh, in the field that 30 something year olds were like they're giving up. It's like we, we just can't make this work anymore. We are depressed. We are we are anxious all the time. We're looking for money all the time. And you're going to lose really, really good people. Uh, the other thing also is that, you know, uh, in the first place, a lot of people get into conservation because of passion. But passion doesn't bring food to your table. All right. OK. Well, you know, I'm going to come back. We're going to take a quick break. We'll keep you both on the line, but we're going to come back and talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how to look for more funding and the government's role in, in all this. Uh, we're going to come back with a look uh, at what the budget allocation in 20, uh, budget 2021 was for the environment. So uh, well, stay tuned to consider this. <laughs> Hi, thanks for staying with Sherrod and I on Consider This. Let's continue our conversation with Wong Siu Lin and Wong Siu T. Recently, a panel of the world's top biodiversity scientists convened to investigate the links between pandemic risk and the degradation of nature. The Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services recently released a report which asserts the need to address the cause of pandemics, which they claim are the same uh, that's driving biodiversity loss and climate change. Siulin, I'm wondering whether this call has been addressed in Budget 2021 or even in the uh, reorganisation of parliamentary select committees or even fundamentally in how we, the public, think about uh, what the nation's priorities ought to be? Well, definitely, uh, all the attention is being focused on health, uh, for good reason, and on the economy, for also good reason. Uh, unfortunately, yes, uh, the source of uh, COVID-19, as well as other, uh, uh, you know, sort of um, virus-based diseases, uh, is actually in, in nature, in wildlife, you know. So you have things like deforestation, when humans get too close to wildlife, to forests, uh, they're actually exposing themselves uh, to the possibility of disease outbreaks, where things like wildlife trade keep keeping these cute animals that Sharad was talking about as pets uh, actually exposes you to uh, a higher uh, risk of uh, contracting the disease. Uh, so, you know, all these things are, it, it takes a combination of different things from public awareness to government, to, you know, NGOs, to, to everybody, basically having an, a very high awareness of, of this happening and trying to do something about it. Now, in terms of the budget, uh, the two ministries that, that basically are involved uh, with, with uh, sort of nature or the environment will be the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources and the Ministry of uh, Water, um, Water and the Environment. Yeah? So in Budget 2021, uh, just referring to my notes here, uh, we actually have the Ministry of Natural Resources uh, getting 2.1 billion uh, in terms of uh, ex uh, an allocation, which is actually seeing a rise of about 12% uh, 
uh, for development allocation compared to last year, which which technically should be good news. Yeah, how they're going to spend this always is is going to be the issue. Uh, amongst that, I think some of the good news is that about 70 million are actually going to be federal incentives for states to uh, conserve biodiversity. And this is one of the things that came up when we talked to about four conservation groups in Malaysia, asking them what was on their wish list for Budget 2021. And that was one of the things they said, you know, you need, you need, you need, you do need funding for, uh, especially at state level, and you do need a better coordination between federal and state. Suti, if I could draw you into this conversation, uh, did you see anything in Budget 2021 that could help, potentially help you? Have you seen any impact, uh, potential impact for your work? Well, obviously the budget did not mention that how much being allocated to help our centre. And I, but I really hope that you know with these numbers, you know, they, the the state did uh, being allocated, and then some of it can come to help us as well. I really, really hope that it it it, it does. And uh, protecting wildlife across the nation is not an easy task. It requires a lot of effort, some lots of money. And because we have a vast forest, you know, like say, for example, Sabah, half of the Sabah total land area is still forested. And then in theory, compared to other countries, we need to have ranges, say, for example, stationed in the forest and looking for any dead people who will go and kill and poach either wildlife or Gaharu and all these variable resources that found in our forest. So that require a lot of funds. And then uh, projects, conservation projects like us also require a lot of funds. Research projects also require a lot of funds. A lot of the research projects are so important because the data, the information that this research project find out will help management. So all of the wildlife management has to be scientific based. Uh, as the foundations of all the major activities that we are working on. Say, for example, right now I'm working on the Sunday action plan for the Sabah state, and we require a lot of money. Uh, so hopefully this will help us. I can just say hope, and then hopefully a lot of money uh, can be allocated to, to, to help wildlife and, well, and also fund there. So. Well, Siuti, while, while I have you, I wanted to ask you, you know, with this new report that's come out, it's, it's made, uh, I guess, uh, you know, a, a push, of pressing need, the fact that we need to address the, um, I guess, the underlying reasons for uh, potential future pandemics. And one of the ways to do that is to deal with the biodiversity diversity and they point to the fact that if we don't deal with it now the, uh, the costs and the uh, both capital and uh, human costs would be catastrophic do you think that this could perhaps push the needle in any way i understand we are dealing with the, the pandemic right now but also we need to address the potential for future uh, pandemics and uh, preserving biodiversity is a key element of that Absolutely, absolutely. I think for us as a Malaysian, everybody needs to know the importance of biodiversity. Biodiversity is not just a word called biodiversity in the end of the story. Biodiversity is an action for us to protect our forests. We are sitting at one of the highest biodiversity hotspots in the world. And this pandemic is a good wake-up call that we need to keep wildlife wild. You know, when human population is rising and then we start to encroach, we need more land to develop our agriculture, build roads, build housing and blah, blah, blah. But we need to protect our wildlife so that it is always wild, so that it keeps minimum contact between us humans and the wildlife. Sulin, uh, in the minute that we yeah. have left, I mean, you're looking at Parliament. I understand parliamentary select committees now no longer, any of them, no longer deal with the environment. What's your take on that? I think it's a, it's a crying shame. So when the new parliamentary select committees were, were announced, uh, there were nine instead of ten, and there was a, a big change as well in, in the composition, and environment was gone. So even uh, under the Pakatan uh, government, uh, there, there, were, uh, there was one which was uh, on science, innovation, and environment, but it only got established late in 2019, and, and we all know what happened in early 2020. So that's gone. Uh, and and under, uh, none of the new nine uh, parliamentary select committees 
studies uh, include um, environment. So I guess the, the closest that will, uh, it will come to would be the health science and innovation one. And I know I certainly know that one MP, uh, Puzia Saleh, I think she's the MP of Kuantan, mm -hmm. actually tried to raise this issue and try to have uh, to have environment included. Uh, or you know either a new and uh, environment uh, pol sorry a new parliamentary select committee, or to have it actually you know come up uh, in in the title of one of these uh, existing ones right. and has failed uh, for that to happen. Well, thank you both for being on the show tonight and raising such important points. We wish you all the best of luck with your work. Uh, thank you for being on. Consider this. That's all we have for you on this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris, and I'm Sharad Kutton signing off the evening. Thank you so much for watching and good night.